Hello, hello, and have you been waiting for this moment? I have. This is the time we get to read the Word of God together, study the Word of God together, worship together. There's nothing like it. Let's start with Psalm 91. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. For he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only look with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord your dwelling place, the Most High, who is my refuge, No evil shall be allowed to befall you, no plague come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up lest you strike your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the adder, the young lion and the serpent you will trample underfoot. Because he holds fast to me in love, I will deliver him. I will protect him because he knows my name. When he calls to me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Amen. Amen. Well, for our praise moment today, we're going to be looking again at the last of the Psalms of Ascent. Fifteen songs they sang as they went up to Jerusalem, to the house of God. Oh yes, after some time we're going again to the house of God. We're going to worship him together. Oh, we still rejoice with that, don't we, today? And we know what that feels like. Well, in Psalm 134, we said yesterday, who am I? I am his servant. Bless the Lord, all you servants of the Lord. Well, tonight I'm going to ask the question, if I'm his servant, what do I do? In Psalm 134, verse 1, praise the Lord or bless the Lord, all you servants of the Lord who minister by night in the house of the Lord. So what is the answer to the question? What do I do? I minister. I minister, well, in this case, they were ministering by night. I minister. Oh, that's so important. When you are ministering, whether it is in a worship team, a choir, an usher, teaching the children, teaching a go group, whatever you are doing to minister, you are called to minister, not to entertain. That's not what we do. We minister. And we minister both to the Lord and to the people as well. The word minister there, in the ESV, it's translated to stand. In the NLT, it's translated to serve, who serves by night. But you know the word, it means to present. To present, like a gift that is presented to the one you're giving it to. For example, in Genesis 43, verse 15, so the men took the gifts and double the amount of silver, and Benjamin also. They hurried down to Egypt and presented themselves to Joseph. So we have to have that mentality. When we are ministering, we have to have that attitude or that posturing of ourselves that we're not just singing songs, or we're not just um, ushering, or we're not just whatever we're doing. But even as we are doing those things, we are presenting ourselves as an offering, as a living sacrifice, and also presenting ourselves as though for evaluation. Lord, here I am. 
See if there be any wicked way in me, Lord. Examine me. Search me, O Lord. (laughs) My husband loves to present me with gifts. And he has quite the criteria. He has a list of things that he goes for when he does such presentation. He goes to great length to present me special things that he knows that I will appreciate or I will like. And he presents them with such a flourish. It's so nice. If you could say, what is the difference between, oh, I need to give somebody this book. Oh, okay, here, here's the book. Or I'm going to present somebody this book. What does that look like? Here is the book you wanted. It's such a different mentality. It's such a different way of looking at it. So we need to look at our ministry that way. Our ministry is not just, oh, we're just doing what we're supposed to do. But we are presenting that ministry to the Lord as an offering and for evaluation. So what do I do? I minister. What do I do? I bless the Lord or I praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, all you servants of the Lord who minister by night in the house of the Lord. So I'm blessing the Lord. I'm lifting up my hands in the sanctuary and blessing the Lord. Of course, that word is barak, which physically can mean to kneel. It can also mean to speak well of. We say good things about the Lord when we're worshiping. And you know what? We're ministering. We're blessing the Lord. It says here, by night in the house of the Lord. This is one of the reasons why Psalm 134 is one of my favorite Psalms of Ascent. And I think I told you that uh, I have 15 favorite Psalms of Ascent, but for tonight, Psalm 134 will be my favorite Psalm of Ascent. But I love this because those who are ministering, those who are serving, These ones, they're doing it by night. You know what that means? It means they don't have an audience of people. (laughs) They don't have an audience of adoring throngs rushing out to get their autograph afterwards, saying, oh, you are so wonderful. Oh, I love that high note. What a beautiful strongs. Oh, no, nothing like that. They're ministering to the Lord. It reminds me of, you know, when we have our drive-in services And we're on the go truck when we're ministering to the people and to the Lord there on the go truck. You know that there's a group of guys, rangers and sound men, who get there like four in the morning for a 730 service to set up their truck, to get everything put out and the speakers in the right place and the PA and all the stands so that nobody will fall over. They are ministering by night in the house of the Lord, so to speak. They don't have an audience of human beings who are saying, yay, well done, good rangers, thank you. Oh, that was, yeah, I loved how you snapped that that metal pole into place. Nobody's saying that. They're ministering for an audience of one. And I think that's what I want to tell you tonight in our praise moment. True worshipers worship for an audience of one. So whatever ministry you are doing, think of this song of ascent. You don't have to minister in front of thousands of people or hundreds of people because you're not there to entertain and you're not there to be applauded and you're not there. We're not there for our own fame. We are there to minister to the people and minister to the Lord. Honestly, true worshipers worship for an audience of one. With that, let us go and worship the Lord together.
and say, His love endures forever. His love endures forever. forever His yeah. love endures forever. Hallelujah. His love endures forever. Oh, yeah. His love endures forever. His love endures forever. His love endures forever. His love endures forever. 
these have been very difficult days for many of our families. Now, some of you, <laughs> you're just, as my father would say, you're fat and happy, all right? You're working from home. You're still getting your full salary. You have less expenses because you have no transportation. You don't have to eat uh, at the office. You're not eating your foodie adventures. You're not spending so much money on milk, tea, and Starbucks. So you're actually saving a lot of money right now. But there are others among us. About 14% of our congregation, because you know we call everybody and talk to everybody, about 14% of our congregation is really struggling right now. And for those we taught the offering thought last weekend, the key to provision is giving. The key to provision is sowing, like the widow at Seraphath. Now, I know there are people who have abused the doctrines of, of giving and receiving. I, I, I understand that. But you know us at COP. You haven't seen me every night saying, please click that button right now and give like some, you know, gambling thing on the computer. Instead, you see us talk about, listen, this is time to receive. You've been faithful in your tithing. You've been faithful in your sowing. Now, this is the time to receive. But please, as Brother John teaches you, open your heart and, and learn truth and let your faith grow in this difficult season. This is still a season when God's promises are true. Well, praise the Lord, child of God. Good to be with you again today. You know, we're talking about folks that we find in the Bible that all of a sudden... <clears throat> We realize they have our, we have the same problem. Well, their problem, how they solved it, that same problem can be solved by you. You know, this is, this is a little personal thing in my life. When I was a, a young boy in, uh, in uh, probably the 10th grade, maybe the 11th, they came to school with an IQ test, the intelligence quota. And everybody took the test and, you know, he answered multiple choice and one thing and the other. And then I had an appointment with the counselor at the school. And the lady's sitting there and she's saying to me, uh, well, you, you might have come to school that day a little tired, or you may not have been paying close attention to the questions, but you've scored some below on your IQ test. And of course, I felt terrible. People around me had gotten scores, normal, some of them a little over high. Here I am. I'm thinking, what kind of a deal is this? But now watch this with me, please. Because today, a lot of people think I'm a genius. <laughs> I, I surely don't feel like I've got a low IQ. But watch what can happen if you get close to Jesus. Acts 4.13. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled that they took knowledge of them, that they had been with Jesus. Child of God, when I came to Jesus, everything changed. I went to Bible college and I almost had to drop out because I could hardly read. I could read road signs and things like that. But I mean, I had just wasted my time and not learned how to read. And I would sit at night with, I would go to the Goodwill, which is a place where you get used secondhand things, and I would buy little readers, Dick and Jane, run, Dick, run, run, Jane, run, watch Jane run, watch Dick run. Here comes Spot, that was her dog, Spot. And I'm reading, 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 and I kept getting another a grade, grade, and today I, I've, I've written books, 52 books. Man, he couldn't read when he went to Bible college. But what happened, see, is I have been with Jesus and when you've been with Jesus, and now being with Jesus doesn't, doesn't mean just running around singing Jesus songs and, and uh, showing up at church. That's part of it. But getting in the book. <clears throat> See, <clears throat> here a few years back, I was talking to Dr. Creflo Dollar. <clears throat> he said, what are you doing, John? What, what are you doing now? I said, well, you know, I've worked for, for the Lord for about 30 years. And uh, I've been a wonderful employee. But I'm going to meet him one of these days, not too long from now. And I need to be more than just an employee. I need to be his friend. And, you, <laughs> and if I'd have showed up in heaven that day, the Lord would have looked at me and said, John, you've been a great employee. <laughs> Welcome. Come into the kingdom. But when he, when he sees me, I want him to say, hey, one of my friends is coming. My friend is coming. And uh, if you can just catch a hold of what I'm telling you now, it'll change everything. A boy that could not 
hardly stay in Bible college because he couldn't read. Wrote 52 books that are in about 16 languages uh, all over the world. You know, not long ago, we sent a, a container load of books there, and Brother Summer, I'll just pass them out to you. Uh, thousands of books. But child of God, how does that come to pass? Uh, uh, second, First Corinthians one thirty. Let me read that to you. But of Him, God the Father, are you in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto you wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. You also have access to the most powerful mind ever known and ever even existing today. Philippians two five says, "Let this mind be in you." which was also in Christ Jesus. Child of God, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And if, you, if you're uneducated, and I can't, I hate to admit it, I was a bricklayer. You don't have to have a big education to be a bricklayer. But when, now I had to have a book. I had to read the Bible. And I can read. But I now I've written 52 books. How did it happen? I became a friend with Jesus. I moved into the Jesus I moved into the Jesus situation with all my mind and all my soul and all my heart and all my energies. And then too, by the way, I kept my finances involved because that kept me tied to Jesus because where my treasure is, that's where my, that's where my heart would be. Bless you. Good to be with you. We talk again soon. We've been walking through the book of Romans together. We've gone through the first 17 verses, learning about the servant of the gospel and learning about the gospel. And then we began to pick up with verses 18 through 22, understanding the wrath of God and how desperate the world is for the gospel, for the good news of Jesus. Let's read beginning with verse 18 again. The wrath of God, and we've spent several nights talking about the wrath of God, is being revealed. So this is a reality in our lives today. Against all the godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth of God by their wickedness. Since what is made known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen being understood from what was made, so that men are without excuse. Now we begin what is called the ladder of degeneracy. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts darkened. Though they claimed to be wise, they became fool, fools and exchanged the glory of God, of the immortal God, for images made to look like mortal man and birds and animals and reptiles. Therefore God gave them over to the sinful desires of their heart, to sexual immorality, for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie, and they worshipped and served created things rather than the Creator, who is forever praised. Amen. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts. Even their women exchanged natural relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed indecent acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their perversion. Furthermore, since they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, he gave them over to a depraved mind to do what ought not to be done. And they became filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, depravity, and full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice. They are gossip, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. Can you imagine inventing ways of doing evil? They disobey their parents. They are senseless, faithless, heartless, and ruthless. Although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these very things, but also approve of those who practice them. Now, we walk through the first two parts of this. We've talked about the existence of God's wrath, that God's wrath is something real, and his wrath is revealed from heaven. And we've talked about the fact that God is just in the expressions of his wrath. Now I want to pick up today and begin to teach you about a lifestyle that experiences wrath. As I began to read you through this passage a few moments ago, I talked about the, the ladder of degeneracy. It is a ladder that goes down. At each stage, God gives them over to go lower. God ex gives them over to go lower. God gives them over to go lower until they finally get all the way to the bottom. Now, that, that to me is contrasted with Jesus as the ladder. Do you remember Jacob's ladder back in the book of Genesis? 
Well, in John 1, verses 43 to 51, it says that the angels of God ascend and descend on Jesus. Jesus is the latter. Jesus is the way into heaven. Everyone, everything that accesses heaven has to go through Jesus. He is the latter. Now, there's a ladder going to heaven, and there's a ladder, forgive me, going into total depravity. One ladder goes up, Jesus, we take his ladder, we go up. If we take this ladder, we go down. So let me tonight walk you through, well, we'll see how far. The first step, the first step into the black hole of sin deals with the human mind. Now that makes sense because all temptations come through the mind. Notice in verse 19 through 22. Since what may be known about God is plain to them because God made it plain. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power, divine nature, have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that men are without excuse. This is why God is just in expressing his wrath. For although they knew God, so they're not ignorant, there there is no such thing as a true atheist or a true agnostic. For all they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile. And their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools. Now, Paul shows us here that the first step down into total depravity begins with the mind. This is why Paul was so strong with the church of Corinth about casting down strongholds. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, beginning with verse 4. Paul said, the weapons we fight with are not weapons of this world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. Now, what are these strongholds? Strongholds are not demon fortresses. Strongholds are not, you know, like a geographical tower that's built in the middle of a field as a stronghold to hide in and fight from. These strongholds he defines beginning in verse 5. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Now, these arguments here, it's the Greek word logismo literally means a false reasoning, a false calculation, a false deliberation that arrives at a false proposition. So they say, in our logic, A plus B plus C equals Z, okay? That is false logic arriving at a false proposition. I propose this statement as a truth. But you had false deliberation, false calculation, false reasoning getting you to that false preposition or proposition. Now, brothers and sisters, you have to understand that the world sits around with lots of these, forgive me, logismos, arguments and pretensions. And they sit around and they make all of this deliberation and all of this reasoning and all of this philosophical nonsense. And they arise at these propositions of truth that, forgive me, are absolute nonsense. Let me read it to you from the New Living Translation. We use God's mighty weapons, not worldly weapons, to knock down the strongholds of human reasoning and to destroy false arguments. We destroy every proud obstacle that keeps people from knowing God. There's mind. We capture their rebellious thoughts and teach them to obey Christ. The the first step down into into depravity is in the human mind. You, You pay attention to this False reasoning, false calculation, false deliberation, false deliberation that arrives at propositions that are just absolutely absurd. Now, please, I, I've, as, a young, as a young man, before I, I got born again, I, mean, I, I remember sitting in the philosophy courses and listening to them destroy the very existence of God. You know, God does not exist, and let me give you the following reasons why. And you know what? Everything they say is very logical. I mean, it, they're, all of their, their, their logic is correct, but it's all false. <laughs> and then they get to their proposition, and they say, God does not exist. And, you know, I looked at a professor one time, and I wasn't a Christian yet, and I looked at him and I said, all right, you've made your proposition God does not exist. And then you began to make your logic to prove your proposition. I said, your proposition is not the result of deliberation and thought. Your proposition is where you began your deliberation and thought. And then you went backwards to prove it. 
Now, brothers and sisters, this is false reasoning. This is false calculation. This is false logic, where they start at a proposition, where they start at a statement and then work backwards and try to prove it, rather than following where logic would take them. So Paul said, listen, we, we, we've got to work on this thing. When our mind rejects the knowledge of God, we become affected. Notice in verse 21 and 22, for although they knew God, they neither glorified him nor gave thanks to him, but in their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools. Now, brothers and sisters, this is why when we present the gospel, we cannot just stand up and whip up everybody's emotions with a few miracles. And people will get really excited when God shows his miracles, when God shows his power. And we want people's faith not to rest on the persuasive words of man's wisdom, but on the demonstration of the power of the Spirit. But we also have to give people something to clear up these, these strongholds in their thinking that, that deals with this nonsense in their minds. There is an intellectual element to evangelism because people, forgive me, people have seen the knowledge of God. They've seen it in all of his creation, and they've rejected it. So we have to go through and begin to allow people to intellectually understand truth. Remember, the word of God needs to be planted in people's hearts. We have to address the strongholds and the false ideas that have built those strongholds. We must, we must deal with the mind in evangelism. Now, again, there's a balance in this, and you have to be careful that, that people don't take it in the wrong direction. But we do have to address people's mind in evangelism. All right, so the first step down into degeneracy is the human mind. A human mind that has listened to propositions that worked backward to find their logic, false propositions, false deliberations, false logic, and they try to prove that God does not exist. And Paul said, you know what? We need to come against this. We, we need to sit down with people and begin to get their minds to be opened. Now, part of this is the work of the Spirit, and part of this is you and I just learning to present the clarity of the gospel. Now, I, I don't believe that we need to get into apologetics and we don't need to get into, you know, a lot of this reasoning stuff today. And, and the reason I say that is I really believe that there's power in the message. Do you remember how often I've taught you that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation? And the Greek word power, dunamis, means an inherent power. There is an inherent ability within the message of the gospel. But we do have to present the gospel. We do have to present the simplicity of the logic of the gospel. Man was dead in sin. Man had rejected God. Man had no hope. Man was without God and without hope in this world. Man was born in sin, as we'll get into some of this later on. And then we take it to God loved us, and God sent his son Jesus to take the punishment of our sins. We have to walk them through the, the simple logic of the love of God for mankind. But the mind must be addressed. The second step into the black hole of sin is idolatry. Now, the cause of idolatry is very simple. Verse 22, although they claim to be wise, you know, they, they, oh, we're so smart, you know, we know that God does not exist. We have proven that, that Christianity is the opiate of the people. We have proved that there is no such thing as God. And they sit around and they mock and they laugh. See, once, once they have passed through that barrier, the next step is idolatry. They claim to be wise. They became fools. They exchanged the glory of the immortal God, that glory that they saw in all creation, for images made to look like mortal man and birds and animals and reptiles. So their whole, their whole degeneracy, their whole beginning to take another step down is because in their brain they rejected the existence of God by their own human logic. Now they begin to create idols for themselves. See, the cause of idolatry is very simply the pride in man's wisdom. We've rejected the knowledge of God. There is no God. And the pride in their intellectual ability. So the next thing they do is begin to make idols for themselves. There is no real God. Do you remember the people of Israel? After they come out of Egypt, Moses is up on the mountain. 
What do they do? They immediately walk away from the reality of God they've seen, and the next thing you know, they've made an idol. Even though they'd seen the reality of God, They'd seen the pillar of fire. They'd seen the, the pillar of cloud. They'd, they'd seen the, the water roll back. They'd seen the plagues in Egypt. But something happened in their hearts, and they rejected the knowledge of God. And really, that entire generation, that entire generation never circumcised their children. That entire generation never got to go into the promised land. For 40 years, God had to wait for that generation to die off. They never offered sacrifice to God. They never circumcised their children as a sign of the covenant. That whole genera generation had rejected the knowledge of God. It took the next generation to come along. Now, how did all of this happen? It starts in the mind, and then it goes to idolatry. Now, idolatry moves through stages. Idolatry starts with man exchanging the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal man. Now, people think that God looks like us. Well, yes, we have been created in the image of God, but remember, um, he is immortal and eternal, and you and I are mortal and decaying. So please forgive me, at what stage does God look like us? A baby or an old man who's unable to walk without help? Okay, so, you know, it starts by creating a God in man's image. People always want to... You know, I want a God that looks like me. I want a God that I can understand that looks like me. Then it moves into a God that looks like a bird, made to look like mortal men, and the next stage are birds. And then after that is animals, and then after that is reptiles. Now, by the time you get down to reptiles, you're dealing with snakes and lizards and dragons and things like this. People have moved all the way through a series of types of idolatry. Now, if, if you will go back, for instance, you see the, the dragon god in China. If you will go back through their religious history, I didn't say their spiritual history, their religious history, you will find that there were seasons in the ancient days where they carried around little gods made to look like man, and they kept, they kept them in their, their pockets when they were went to war and things like that. They, they had gods that they worshipped ancestors that they worshipped, the little figurines that they worshipped. They started with worshipping man and then went through the stages until now they're down to dragons. Now let me give you an illustration of this. Ezekiel chapter 8, verses 9 and 10. And he said to me, Ezekiel, go in and see the wicked and detestable things they're doing there. We're talking about inside the temple itself. So I went in and looked, and I saw portrayed all over the walls all kinds of crawling things and detestable animals and all the idols in the house of Israel. He saw insects. You put it all together with all of the different versions. He saw insects. He saw lizards. I mean, you, you think of all the idols that you and I have seen through history, carved on walls, and as you study world religions and things, you see all of these things. Man goes down through that. He, he starts worshiping a god that looks like himself, but then he generally goes down, 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 down until he finally gets to snakes, and reptiles. Now, have you ever wondered why snakes are down there at the very last? What was snake, what was, how was Satan represented in Genesis? A snake. God cursed him to crawl on his belly. How was Satan called in the Bible? He's called a dragon in the book of Revelation. Satan always brings people all the way down to his level. So man rejects worshiping the God who is the creator and sustainer of all things. He then moves on to worshiping an idol that looks like a human being, a mortal man. He goes down through birds and animals, and finally he gets down to reptiles and snakes. Amazing. Satan will always bring you down to his level. Now, we're going to work on this some more tomorrow because we're going to get into some very controversial things tomorrow, and I don't want that mixed up with everything else. I want to take time to walk you through it. But I think the big takeaway that you see here tonight is that Satan will always bring you down to worshiping him. Let me say that again. Satan will always bring you down to the level of worshiping him. Now, I, I've just got some attitudes in my life. For instance, if a guy's got snake tattoos and dragon tattoos on his body and he wants to stand up and act like he's a man of God, mm -mm, I'm not going to listen to him. 
Why, Pastor? Because when you start putting insects and snakes and dragons and lizards and things on your body, uh, you've, you're showing where you've come down to. Well, Pastor, then they got born again. Wonderful. Go get those tattoos removed. Wow. Have you ever noticed that tattoos, now young people, please don't get mad at me. Have you ever noticed the tattoos today are skulls? They have to do with death. They have to do with dragons and lizards and death and snakes. Please forgive me, but straight up, Satan always wants to bring you all the way down to his level. It's a ladder down. Jesus is the ladder to the Father. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by him. Let me challenge you today. Would you take the ladder going up with Jesus? Jesus is the way. Take the ladder going up. Don't take the ladder going down. All right, let me pray for you. Father, there's a lot of things as we look at your word that we see going on in the world around us that used to look so innocent and Father, now we begin to understand that these things are far from innocent. They show a spiritual climate that is taking place. I ask that you give young people discernment. I ask that you give them clarity of thought. Let them see clearly through the Word. Let them see clearly and understand the environment that they live in. Be cautious with these things. And Father, I pray across our entire nation Give our nation eyes to see the reality of God. Lord, as a farmer looks up at a coconut tree, let him see the glory of God. As a fisherman brings a beautiful fish out of the waters and he sees the glorious colors, let him see the glory of God. Father, as we see a field of rice growing, let us see the goodness and glory of God. Let our people look around at all the creation that you've given us on our beloved islands and see you, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. We'll see you tomorrow morning.